Well, hello everyone and uh, welcome to our workshop this evening. We are the uh, Master Gardeners of Placer County. And this evening we have uh, Julie Long, who has been a Master Gardener since uh, 2013. She'll be talking to us about sheet mulching. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat uh, function and we will go through those uh, at the end of the presentation. All right, Julie, go ahead and uh, begin. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my presentation is about sheet mulching, which I will take you step by step through with this PowerPoint. Uh, my husband and I decided to sheet mulch our front yard about six years ago, and you will be able to see the changes we've made. So here we go. First of all, I need to talk about Master Gardeners and what we do. Um, we are here for the public's use um, to extend research-based gardening information and composting information, um, to present accurate and impartial information to home gardeners, and to give knowledge to make informed garden decisions. Where can you find us? We are everywhere. We are at our demo garden uh, for workshops and open days. Uh, currently, we are starting work on a new demo garden in Loomis. Um, I'm excited about that. Um, we can be found in The Curious Gardener, which is a quarterly online publication, Speakers Bureau, Farmers Markets, Fairs and Festivals, our May Mother's Day Garden Tour, and our March Garden Fair, as well as social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We also have articles in Gold Country Media. Our website, this is amazing. Uh, this is a photo of the homepage of it, and it is a wonderful site that's full of information on gardening. So, why did we sheet mulch? Uh, this is a photo of my home six years ago uh, before we started to sheet mulch. And what's wrong with this? Well, nothing really, but it was boring. And I'd been a master gardener at that point for several years and learned a lot, learned a lot about the importance of trying to get pollinators into your yard and diversity and some native plants. And I had this idea of turning this front yard area on both sides of the garage. There's a smaller side to the right of the garage there that you can't see yet. Um, by turning it into something interesting, by sheet mulching. What is sheet mulching? It is layering mulch and compost and cardboard um, to smother the existing grass and then letting nature do its work in the winter time and in replanting it. Um, so I had this idea to do this and um, here we go. I'm gonna show you what we did. So here's the first slide. This is what it did look like. And to sheet mulch, um, this is the smaller side of the garage that we sheet mulched. And this is where the pictures were taken. And it gives you a really good idea of, of how we did it. Uh, so the first step is to take your lawnmower and mow the grass as low as you can go, and then cover it with two, three inches of compost and spread it out. Here it is, that small lawn area that is now completely covered with compost. And what is the next step? It is to put cardboard over it. This photo shows the cardboard in the foreground and then the compost on top of it. You want to overlap the cardboard, heavily overlap the cardboard, because if you happen to have Bermuda grass, which most of us do, it is a bugger to get rid of and it will find its way through the cracks in between the layers of cardboard. That's why I recommend you you really overlap this cardboard well. 
This photo shows the different layers. Um, so in the foreground, you can still see some cardboard. Then the next layer was a thin layer of compost. And right there in the middle, right here, is actually the final step, which is to put, um, good grief, blanking on the word, uh, not compost, but mulch. Mulch. Mulch, thank you. <laughs> mulch on top of the the um the compost so that just shows you the three different layers and here's the finished product um you can see in the background here we actually wrapped the cardboard up against the gate there um that was just to protect the the wood on the gate from rotting because it will get wet with this cardboard and uh, the rain's coming so that's why we did that so the cool weather comes, this was in November, by the way, when we started this. And the funny story is that I'm always in the front yard doing something and I always look like I just crawled out from under a rock. I'm dirty, got crappy clothes on. My neighbors are used to it. But uh, on this particular day, my husband and I were out here and it started raining and we were shoveling compost first and then you know the, the the laying the cardboard down in the rain and then doing the compost and then doing the mulch on top and it's raining and now it's all sticking to our wet body and our neighbors were driving in and out of our court looking at us like what are they doing now um it was pretty funny really I just should have put a sign out saying you know wait a few months it'll be better but we do laugh about it because they really thought we were a little crazy. So this is a finished product though. And this was in November. And um, so now you're waiting for the rain to come. What does the rain do? Well, it breaks down that cardboard that is under the mulch and compost layers. And it, while it's breaking it down, it's actually smothering the existing lawn that's there. And that's what you want. You want the lawn to disappear. What else does that cardboard do? Well, when it breaks down, it actually becomes part of the soil and it enriches the soil. So it's it's a great use for cardboard. It's it's not using any chemicals to, to kill the lawn. And it's a really fun process to watch. So six months later, actually it was five to six months later, uh, we started that in November and this was in May but we were actually able to trench through and make the dry creek bed in April. So that was five months later. We did find a few pieces of cardboard here and there, little pieces that hadn't broken down, but all in all, it was, it was pretty much gone. Um, so we decided to put this dry creek bed through the, the front here because it, number one, it adds interest. Uh, Number two, it's easier to landscape when you've got two distinct spots instead of one big spot. At least it's easier for me. And um, we also have a slope there. It's not a real steep slope, but the dry creek bed can catch any water that might be coming off that slope. Instead of going to the sidewalk and down the gutter, it's going to catch it and let it percolate down into our soil, therefore keeping the moisture on our own property, which is what we want. Um, but really, it just adds so much interest. And we hand trenched this. It's not that deep. It wasn't hard to do because the soil was wet, you know, or damp from the winter rains. And we did not put a liner underneath it. There's no landscape cloth. There's certainly no plastic. You want the water to percolate down. Uh, so that's that's what we did. And I actually got all of this rock almost for free. Um, I watch for free things, I'm cheap, and it's fun to find free things. So I went and loaded up all those little medium-sized river rocks from um, somebody that lived not too far away from me getting rid of them. And I counted, I think it was like 1,243 of those rocks when I unloaded them. And then the bigger rocks I got from my parents' property. So, um, Anyway, we, we put the dry creek bed in. We did leave some of the existing plants, especially on the right there where you see the lavender, and we did leave the, um, the 
manzanita in the background. That's a, a dwarf manzanita. It's a ground cover. And it's called emerald carpet manzanita. We left that. That is a California native. It's a great brown cover and it still looks great. Um, so you're probably wondering, what is this, uh, you know, irrigation that you can see in the foreground and the background? That is called inline drip. And this is the system we used. In fact, we have the system throughout our entire landscape, front and back. Uh, what you do is you, could we did this backwards. This is, this is our mistake, you learn, right? Uh, we should have put the plants in first and then take the inline drip. And the idea is to snake the inline drip around the base of each plant, around the, the root zone of each plant. It emits a gallon of water per hour and the holes in this drip system are 12 inches apart. Um, so it gives a really nice soak to the root zone of the plants, which is what you want for healthy plants. This was the first time we used it. So we did it backward. It still works, but it's easier to put the plants in first and then do the irrigation around those plants. So from that point on, we that's exactly what we did. Here's the landscaping finish. This was this two months later, maybe. Um, you can see in the foreground, we have some lantana, some um, some grasses, some Coryopsis moonbeam, and some lavender. Um, so this was just right away. And it, it's important to mulch. Um, I'm gonna go back one. You can see all through here that everything is heavily mulched and you would add mulch after you plant the plants and after you put the irrigation in. What does mulch do? It is great for insulation. Insulation to keep the moisture in the soil in the summer so it doesn't evaporate as easily. And it also um, is a weed deterrent, especially when you put in a nice and thick, say two to three inches thick, um, it's a great weed deterrent. Uh, this mulch was dumped in my driveway for free. I love free. Uh, look, look through your neighborhood and watch for tree chippers. Arborists or just tree people doing work in the neighborhood, they almost always have a chipper with them. And approach them and ask if they wouldn't mind dumping it in your driveway. And it's free. So I ended up here with like 15 yards. It was a lot. Um, and you can see to the left here, there, there is some green material in here. This was, I believe, redwood trees or partially redwood trees. So these, this was from the redwood trees and that's okay. It, it's fine, it, it's, a, it's a mulch still. Um, so anyway, it was free, it saved me a lot of money and I, I love to push mulch. I think it's really important. So this is three months later, things are already growing. You can see it starting to develop. This was one year later, um, huge difference in one year. All of these plants are not still there, but most of them are. Um, as you know, most gardeners do, it's never done. <laughs> I mean, I had a plan, but you know, sometimes they get too big for the space or they just don't you know perform like you like and you you yank them out but all in all it's it's pretty much still the same i just added a lot more i love the way the plants here this is a uh, santa barbara daisy i love the way they go over the edge of this dry, dry creek bed and soften it that's really pretty this was two years later Another huge difference. Since this, we have removed this ornamental cherry tree here to the right um, for many reasons, but it looks better without it. Uh, if you want to know, these large grasses here are called Mullenbergia dubia. They are a dwarf deer grass. Um, don't let the dwarf word fool you. 
they actually get quite large. I do love them. Uh, super easy to care for. The foreground is lantana. Over to the side, I have California fuchsia, um, coyote mint, uh, a lot of salvias that you can't see in this picture, in addition to lavenders. This was just last month. This was August uh, of this year. Uh, you can see how it's developed drastically. Um, I love it. We get a lot of questions about it from people walking, neighbors walking by, people walking their dog. Um, like I said, I'm outside a lot. And I love it when people ask questions because it's a great way to educate as to why we did this. And, um, you know, the primary reason was for me to add interest, but, you know, equally as important was that what we planted here brings in the bees, the butterflies, the, um, the, the moths, the, the pollinators, the hummingbirds. And it, it's just fascinating to watch. And just so interesting and, and it's so alive with something going on all the time. This is another view uh, taken last month, just a different angle that looks up the dry creek bed. Um, back here in the background, that is a lavender that's called Mirlo lavender, which I love because of the foliage color. Um, Santa Barbara Daisy, Lantana. This here is California fuchsia. Back here is lavender. These here to the left, you can't see them very well, but those are blue grama grass, which are California native, and I love those. Now, what happened on the other side of the driveway? Uh, the small space that I showed the photos of when we were doing the layer mulching, this is it. Now it doesn't look like this right now, but this was right away. So we removed this, this lawn, of course, and what to do with this small space. Well, this is an east facing um, front yard. So my backyard gets too much shade to grow a vegetable garden. It's, I have a lot of oaks back there. And I struggled to grow vegetables. And so I thought, okay, let's put the vegetables in the front yard. So these uh, split rail fencing materials here, once again, they were free. Somebody was giving them away. I went and snagged them. My husband built these. Um, he put rebar in each corner to hold them together. Then he ran irrigation to them. So we planted vegetables here and we do so every year. Here's um, that first year with vegetables, tomatoes and peppers. And we have a fruit tree here in the front in a big pot. And this is a view from the sidewalk of the same, the same spot. So we do have a buffer here. This whole area in front is a buffer next to the sidewalk. And as you can see, we've got more lavender, we've got Coreopsis moonbeam, we've got cone flowers, um, different kinds of uh, geraniums, the fruit tree, which is actually a mandarin. Um, this changes all the time too, but I just think it's really pretty from the street that you see this buffer. And then behind it, here are our raised beds. It's not a lot of space for vegetables. I wish I had more, but I do like having at least a little bit. And this is just another photo. This was last month, I believe. Um, just, just another photo of a different view. And then I wanted to point out that, uh, you know, to, to get pollinators is not just about having flowers that they're attracted to. Um, they also need, well, pref would prefer water sources. And so I have several different types of water sources. In addition to bird bath, in, a bird bath in the front, we have a fountain and we also have just these terracotta 
saucers that I put pebbles in. Um, butterflies like can't just fly in and get a drink of water. Butterflies and moths need a place to land so that they can drink. And they also like the minerals that these rocks produce. So even though this might look a little muddy looking, it's that's okay. That's what they like to for that mineral intake. So we have two of these out out front. Here's our fountain, and you can see the the finch here on the left. And here we have a hummingbird. This is in the front yard as well. And um, this is constant entertainment, constant. The birds that come in, um, the squirrels, even the the butterflies that alight. It, it's just really fun to watch this. Here's a western tail. This Western tiger swallowtail butterfly on our Japanese maple. Oops. Great, great. There we go. Sorry. Uh, I think I show this because I think it's important to have a place to sit and watch. Um, it's not just about planting it and, and walking away, it's about enjoying it. So we often eat dinner here. This is in the front of our house. And we often eat dinner here and look out over the front yard and just watch the birds. It's, it's really fun. Um, this last spring, we had a lot of bluebirds for the first time that were coming and going in our, in our yard. And it was fantastic to watch. And I just think you need a comfortable spot to, to enjoy it. And here's ours. Um, here's some of the pollinators that we talked about, um, coneflowers here, and um, in the back I've got some, this is Betty Rollins oregano, and I've got some lavender here in front, it's just pretty to see. This is Coreopsis moonbeam with a small butterfly there in the middle. And lavender is loved, loved, loved by the bees. Here we go. This is an Orion geranium, one of my favorite flowers, um, with a fiery skipper butterfly on it here. Oops. And then lastly, this was in the backyard, but I had to take it and include it. It's, of course, Robin's eggs nest in our our backyard shrub, um, just to show that, you know, it, it, it brings in redoing your yard and making it a habitat for pollinators and, and birds. It's, it's just so interesting. And you're always finding different, different surprises in the yard. Um, so I encourage anybody to do this it's not difficult to layer mulch and at all it, it's really not difficult um i did design this myself we did the installation ourselves it is a small area so it wasn't difficult it was a lot of fun um but i encourage you to try it it, it really will open your eyes to having a different type of yard so let me know if you have any questions thank you for having me that was great, Julie. Thank you very much. Great example of uh, what you can do uh, by eliminating yard and creating a, a beautiful space for all kinds of flora and fauna. Uh, looks like we do have one question in the chat. Um, if any of you have more questions, please go ahead and enter them there. TC, would you like to go through that question? Certainly. This question is from Nancy. She says, what about the option for a little area for artificial grass. A friend near Sacramento has a section that looks nice. Are there any local landscapers, preferably Amador County, who install it? Well, first thing that comes to mind is why would you want it? <laughs> uh, personally, I don't care for it. Um, it's, and I'll tell you why, it, it 
first of all, you can usually tell that it's not real. And then secondly, what do you do with it when it ends its life? It ends up in the landfill and it's a petroleum product. And I don't like that. Um, but why would you, why would you want it? it I, I don't think you'd, you'd want it to sit on. Um, I would say <laughs> I don't have any firsthand experience with it, nor do I know any installers of it. But I would maybe encourage you to rethink putting it in. I think that you can have a lot more of genuine interest if you would stick with plants um, that would bring in the pollinators and the interesting birds. Um, there's so many choices to pick from. So I um, hope that helps. I, I'm just not a fan. <laughs> I, I might add something to there, Julie. Um, there are some uh, native grasses that are low mow or no mow, you know, maybe mow once a year. If that is the prerequisite, if you're trying to go low water usage, perhaps, and that's the, uh, the reason for using artificial grass, that would be my two cents there. That's a great idea, TC. Um, thanks for that. Yes, there's, a, there's so many different kinds of grasses that are more clumpy looking usually, um, but you don't have to mow them. Uh, so, maybe that would be an option to look into instead of artificial. Um, unless you you know have a really good reason or just like artificial grass. Um, but great, great options. Thanks, TC. Mm -hmm. Looks like there might be a couple more in there, TC. Oh, I'm not seeing. They, they popped up uh, while Julie was answering the first one. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm not seeing them. Oh, okay. Uh, this is from uh, Shelly Hollowell, and uh, she's wondering, uh, do the inline drip hook up to your sprinklers? Um, so we, yes, I mean, you have to retrofit. Um, and honestly, my husband did it, not myself, but uh, we had existing sprinklers there for the lawn. So um, the existing piping for that was removed and, and then he retrofitted with the existing anti-siphon valves and all that, that still works, but he did have to hook it up differently to this inline drip system. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't know more about it than that, but I will say that um, first of all, if you decide to use inline drip, or any other kind of irrigation that is more efficient than what you have. Look with your local, check with your local water agency and see if they offer rebates for doing so. Um, when we did this six years ago, our water agency offered up to $500 rebate, not, not for labor, but for materials. So they had to come out and give, give us a water audit, which is free. And then we, we did all this with the new irrigation and turned in our receipts and we received $500 and that was wonderful. So that's one thing. And another thing I will say is that uh, the inline drip that I recommend is called Netifin, N-E-T-I-F-I-N, I believe. That is only sold at irrigation supply stores, not at a big box store. And your local irrigation supply stores are usually really knowledgeable about how things are supposed to work and how, how what you need to do that. So I would recommend using them and buying your, your sprinklers supplies from them because they're usually super helpful. I think I would add one more thing about the sprinklers. Sprinklers and drip really need to be on separate circuits, separate valves, because sprinklers generally put out water much faster than drip systems. So you wouldn't want them on the same circuit. Uh, in your case, you just replaced your lawn with drip, so you didn't need to retain any of the sprinkler function. But if you did, then you'd want to set up a second valve, a second zone, to take care of the drip. 
Absolutely. Good, good point. And I can add one more thing to that too. <laughs> uh, I didn't talk about it, but trees, uh, we, the, the trees we have there are, are native oaks and um, we had a Japanese maple. Uh, those have inline drip around them too. And everybody knows oaks really aren't supposed to get, you, you can kill oaks with too much water. So everything we planted is low water use. And however, if you had an area where you were layer mulching and you did decide to keep landscape trees, say you had a maple or something there, um, make sure that, I mean, what, what, what's the best thing to do for trees like, so like a landscape tree is to make sure that they have their own circuit and that they have that inline drip wrapped around the trunk many, many times out to the drip line. And then to make sure that it's on its own circuit because trees require a deep, deep, slow irrigation. And if they are on their own circuit and you can give them that, it's infrequently done. So for example, in the summertime, if you had a maple and I'm just doing a wild guess. You might get, get by with every 10 days to two weeks with a deep soak. That's why it's important to pay attention to those trees and not, they don't want surface water, they need a deep water. Shelly was also wondering uh, how your plants held up uh, in the peak heat of summer. Uh, the pictures that I showed from six weeks or six, last month in August, um, that was, well, peak heat was last week, I guess, but that was August. They look great. Uh, all those plants are established now and they do get that deep soak from the inline drip that runs for, I think an hour and a half once every week. Uh, they're very happy. They're established, the roots are established. Um, so those pictures, I think, are a pretty good example. I could go back, show you. Um, where were they? Right there. Uh, so that was August. And that was August. So um, I think they, and they still look good. I mean, everything's a little crispy because of last week, but all in all, it's they still look really good. Great. And then uh, Krista was wondering if uh, there are any websites you can recommend for uh, uh, sheet mulching. Actually, I have a, um, a handout for sheet mulching that is step-by-step -step, and it will be included with this presentation when it's uploaded to the Master Gardener website, which should be in about two weeks. So you can look for this presentation on the Master Gardener website for Placer County and included, so you can review this again if you want, and then included will be that handout that's step-by-step, -step, very, very simple, very easy to understand. So just wait a couple weeks and it'll be up. I might add something to that too, Julie. Thanks. I, I uh, Googled that while we were sitting here. And if uh, Krista will... Google U-C-A-N-R and the word sheet mulching, quite a few uh, UC articles will come up on the subject. So that's U-C-A-N-R sheet mulching. Thank you, TC. That's, that U-C-A-N-R website is great for this audience to know anyway. It's mm -hmm. an amazing website as we know for any kind of garden issues, problems, pests, um, solving problems. So thank you for mentioning that. Uh, yeah. One more thing I wanted to mention too was, although my instructions will be on our website, they are not hard and fast, meaning you don't absolutely have to put compost and mulch when you are sheet mulching. The compost though, the compost layer um, breaks down so easily with that cardboard to aid the soil. That's why I recommend doing it. 
But if you didn't do it and you just did the mulch, it would still work. You're just enriching the soil further if you use it. And where I say two to three inches, that's an estimate. You can do what you want really to a point. Um, so don't feel like you have to get out there with a the measure tape. <laughs> so. Okay, well, I think that takes care of all the questions. Thank you again, Julie, for that great presentation. Thank you to all our participants who came out tonight uh, to view this presentation. If you do have any questions, you can always go to our website, uh, UC Master Gardeners of Placer County, and you can submit questions electronically there, or uh, you can give us a call at our hotline number and we can help you out with uh, questions about sheet mulching or really any home gardening question that you have. So thank you again, uh, stay tuned. We have more workshops upcoming. If you go to our website, they're listed there. And I hope you all have a great evening. Good night. Good night.